Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this second session in the Managing Your Sporting Archives series. My name is Laura, and I'm one of the archivists based at Explore York Libraries and Archives. This presentation is one of a set of three, which has been generously funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund as part of our Uncovering York Sporting Heritage project. This project is a joint project between Explore, York City Football Club Foundation and York City Knights Rugby League Foundation and is looking at connecting the residents of York with the sporting heritage that can be found in the city and we're very grateful to the National Lottery Heritage Fund for helping us to bring this topic to life more with sporting groups through these presentations. As I say this is the second presentation so for the first session we looked at what archives actually are, how you identify what archives you should be keeping and how to arrange those archives in a way that makes sense to anyone using them. In today's session, we're going to look at storage conditions for archives, how best to package them, and how to avoid them being damaged by pests. In the final session, using your archives, we'll look at how you can use your archives in your own communities and with your members. Today, we're also going to look a bit about digital archives as well as physical ones. There are three main learning objectives for this session. So by the end, you should understand why archives can deteriorate over time if they're stored in poor conditions. You should have a greater awareness of the risks to your archives and how to implement affordable storage solutions and feeling control of your digital archives and able to store them appropriately. So to start with the basics, I thought one of the things we should probably look at is what is a book? So this is a diagram taken from the iBook Binding blog, so it's not my, not my presentation, but it gives a really good example of what a book actually is. I think sometimes we take it for granted um, because we're so used to buying them, we're so used to um, taking them out of a library, going to a bookshop and buying some. Um, they're actually really complex things and because they're complex, it means we have to manage them in particular ways to everything will react slightly differently to the conditions that it finds itself in. So a book itself, the primary section of the book are the book signatures. So these are the paper pages, which are then sewn together and quite often bound together with some form of glue. So either a synthetic glue or an animal-based glue. The paper itself is all made from organic materials. And whilst we can standardize this now in modern production, in older production, you would always get a slightly varied quality of paper that comes at the end of it. Um, the, the main reason for this is to do with the lignin content. So lignin is found in organic materials and it's what makes the paper go brown over time. So that's why with modern methods, we can remove a lot of that um, compared to how we could do previously. So we get pointer paper for longer or archival quality paper. At the front and back of the book signatures, you find the end papers. These are quite often thicker paper, again, made using organic materials. You've always got a headband and a tailband, which goes onto the spine, which has backing material. So it's a range of different mesh or stronger paper or um, more sewing to pull everything together. And then you have the case, which is effectively the covers. So quite often they're cardboard, but they could be um, board, they could be kind of stronger materials, and they're quite often leather bound, they could be paper bound, so everything will react slightly differently. So with that in mind, the other thing we need to look at for this session is what is a photograph? And the answer to that is something particularly complicated. If we think a book is complicated, a photograph, again something we take for granted, can equally be particularly difficult to manage. So if we go for a dictionary definition first, a photograph is usually a positive image on paper, although it can refer to any processes in which light sensitive media is used to create a visible image. Photographs are really complex physical and chemical structures. They are usually a paper backing for the print with layers of chemicals on top of that, which react differently to the additional chemicals that are used in the process of manufacturing the image which means they've got to be handled and packaged correctly. Each one of those chemicals reacts slightly differently. 
the other thing we have to bear in mind is photographic processes have evolved. There's never been one standard process for creating a photographic print. So quite often you need to know what type of process you're dealing with in order to work out the best storage conditions. And colour photographs are more complex than black and white and more sensitive to light. So colour photographs have more layers because each layer has to react to give the kind of reds, blues, greens, yellows that you get in the actual image itself to make it a colour photograph. Um, and because they're more sensitive to light, that's quite often why you find that they fade more. And for some reason, the 70s and 80s manufacturing processes, they tend to go much browner, much more faded um, than some other processes. The other thing to talk about and to highlight is that film and negatives produced before the 1950s, so ones that are not marked as safety film, are incredibly unstable. That's moving image um, footage, audiovisual film and photographic negative stock. Um, there are particular health and safety executive guidelines on what you need to do with um, safety film that's cellulose nitrate, um, but we can advise on that. So if anybody's worried, please do contact us and I'll put the contact details at the end of this presentation or contact your local archive service. So in terms of the issues with archives, there are a number. Um, so I've gone through them in various sections and I've got some photographic examples of what I'm talking about. So the issues, storage issues, can be categorised as environmental and security. So for security, we're talking fire, flood, theft. What I thought I'd do today in this presentation, because time is limited, we'd look at the environmental issues. That's probably the ones that you're most unfamiliar with. Um, and I'm assuming you're looking for a storage space which is secure with an appropriate fitted Bur burglar alarm and fire alarms or smoke detectors. Ideally, we're in York, which is not on a ground floor or not in an area that's risk of had at risk of flooding. So with the environmental conditions, dust and dirt are a major cause of damage to archives. So the one thing to bear in mind is that your space has to be clean. It is quite honestly as simple as dusting and hoovering and making sure that the dust particles are removed. We'll come on to other ways you can protect the archives themselves from the dust, but as an essential starting point, it's got to be clean. Natural light can cause permanent fading to records um, and it also increases the room temperature, so it gives you a double problem. So if you have windows, you can purchase a blackout blind and make sure that everything is boxed. Ideally, we're looking at cardboard boxes and I will come back to that as to the reasons why. You might also find that books and paper documents end up with foxing. So foxing is particularly distinctive. It's where small metal particles in old paper and impurities in the paper react to the climate conditions that they're in, and in particular sunlight. And it's what causes small brown marks on the paper or a photograph. So you get small brown spots across them. So if you keep them in stable conditions and keep them out of direct sunlight, that will help with that. And you can also get destruction of the lignin in earlier papers in particular by sunlight and absorbed atmospheric pollution. So that's what causes the paper to go brown and crumble at the edges. With cheaper manufacturing methods, so things like newsprint, they're often quite acidic. They've not taken out the neutralizing contaminants. Um, they've not actually neutralized the acid, as it were, even. Um, so what happens is that's what makes that those types of prints particularly vulnerable and particularly prone to going brown and crumbling. They're also much, much thinner. They are designed to be thrown away. To give you an idea about how these kind of conditions can affect archives, these are actually some examples from our collections, but I should say these are in their original state as they were received by the archive service. Um, so we haven't actually done any processing activities on these archives specifically. But you'll see in the image on the left, you've got a combination of dust and dirt, which is just what is on the bottom of the sets of papers and up the right hand side. These have also got some water damage to them, which is what's causing the kind of marking of the pages and things as well. And because they've clearly been kept in damp conditions, the metal fastening on the left hand image is incredibly rusty. So we'll come back to what you do about those, but those are some of the recognisable signs. And the image on the right is just designed to show you what some of these records can look like in their original state. So the second set of issues are more about pests and climate issues again. So the worst culprits for archives are small mammals. 
So they love to use paper for bedding materials, for nesting materials. They will shred paper documents. They don't really mind how old the paper is or what's written on it. They also have a habit of chewing into storage boxes, including plastic ones. So the main thing to do is to try and avoid the space where you're keeping your archives having any mammals or insects in there, particularly the mammals. Try and block up holes where anything could get in and cause damage. The most insects that we find in the home are non-pests, so they're not a massive issue. So things like spiders and wood lice and things like that. But some, like silverfish, will decimate paper. They will literally eat their way through the documents. And they don't start at one side, inevitably. They will eat their way up and down through a text block and effectively turn it into Swiss cheese, so it becomes very, very unstable. If you're storing your books and documents in a room with a carpet or a wooden floor, remember that whatever you do, they will both attract pests. So again, it's hoovering, it's cleaning, it's making sure that everything's as clean as you can get it. Poor storage conditions generally, um, as we've seen in the previous image, can cause metal fasteners, pins, paper clips and staples to rust, as well as the interior rings of ring binders and lever arch files. So again, the best thing to do with this is just to remove them if it's possible to do so, if you're not going to rip the papers round about them. We tend to use brass paper clips for everything because brass has a tendency not to rust, so they're just a lot more stable. I know most people out there will look for sturdy boxes to store their archives and will go for plastic storage boxes, but actually they can be a real problem, particularly where they're stored in sunlight or in a warm space. A bit like a greenhouse effect, the plastic storage boxes can create a microclimate inside, which is much more humid and much warmer. So it's more likely that mould is going to grow in that space. And mould is horrendous. Once it takes hold, it's quite difficult to stop. Um, it is also a health risk to people, so it really should be dealt with by specialists. So it will grow in damp and humid conditions and it will take off at quite a rate. So you do really have to watch for that and keep checking your records and making sure that they're in a stable state and there's no sign of mold. Um, if you find mold, the best thing you can do is wrap the affected items in cling film and freeze them. But if you do that, when you defrost them, you're gonna have more problems. So you need to get them to a specialist conservator. So it's worth contacting a specialist conservator before you go down that route. I don't have many, as obviously as a professional archivist, I don't have many examples of mould on records, but our building had a leak um, in its basement not that long ago, so we got mould on the floor just as a result of having the water and having the, the heat build up. So just to give you an idea of what that looks like in another setting. Um, this is white and kind of quite fluffy, quite powdery, looks a bit like candy floss. Um, sometimes the mould can be green and slimy, sometimes it can be black mould, which you tend to find in bathrooms, but you'll find it on documents as well. If the mould is quite powdery, so kind of quite dry and powdery, the chances are it's dyed. So in those circumstances, you can, as long as you're doing it safely, ideally with a mask on, you can brush the mould off. But bear in mind that just because it's dyed, it doesn't mean it won't reactivate as well. So you still need to watch the storage conditions, but there's less of a risk if it looks very powdery and very, very dry. So the other issues can be quite often to do with just general storage. So one thing I see a lot is having too many pages in a ring binder or a folder and storing them upright on shelves. So what happens is just the sheer weight of the papers causes the pages to tear, particularly around the holes where the rings are holding them into the ring binder. So it's the weight pulls them off. And we see the same problem with books where books have been stored upright over a period of time. And if you look at a book, um, particularly a hardback book, you'll find that the headband and the tailband, they're, they're slightly higher than the text block. So the text block's not sitting on the shelf. The spine is slightly longer. Um, so what that causes is the weight of the text block will pull itself off the binding and then it's got to be rebound. We need to bear in mind that early books, so kind of 15th, 16th century books, were incredibly expensive and they were produced to be really robust. But as books become wide, wider in circulation and more people are buying them, they become more affordable, 
bindings get cheaper. So the particularly 19th century bindings are quite poor quality and they can actually affect the paper inside the book as well. So you might get damage to the paper pages that's coming straight from the binding it's in. We've talked about dirt and dust. That's particularly bad in folded documents because the dirt has a tendency to build up in the creases which causes the document to become brittle, tear or acid to eat from the dust to eat through the folds. So it becomes very vulnerable in those creased areas. And I think it's particularly unlikely that any of the sporting clubs that we're talking about and talking to you who are listening to this will have parchment documents, but you might. Um, just to bear in mind, it has a tendency to continue to react like skin because it was skin originally, it's animal skin. So if it gets too wet, it will expand and wrinkle but unlike a human or unlike an animal, it will not return to its original state. It becomes very, very hard and very brittle and the damage is irreversible. So you really do have to look out for parchment documents and make sure they're kept dry. I wanted to give an example of um, the issues that you see with the, the folds. So these documents, there's been some degree of water damage to them. You'll see in the right hand image, kind of halfway down the page, there's a lot of fading in the text and that seems to have been caused by water damage. So that's made the document wet and then the documents dried out. And then there's obviously dust has got into the folds and it's weakened all the, the folds and the pages have split. So in these scenarios, you can get them repaired um, you need a professional conservator to do that and it will cost um, but it is a bit like piecing a jigsaw back together so the melanex folder we have in the image on the right will actually keep those pieces in place without having to physically repair them so it's a good halfway house it's a good step but you shouldn't be taking things in and out of the melanex folders if you do that it's something to leave them in to keep everything together so you don't lose bits so looking at the main issues how do we rectify them and how do we how should we be storing archives to try and mitigate as many of these risks as possible we'll never eliminate all these risks but how do we mitigate some of them so you're looking for cool storage but not something that's very cold unless you're storing photographs in which case the colder the better so we say 16 degrees is about ideal for paper and photographic materials between five degrees and 25 degrees Celsius is fine as a set of parameters. If you're looking at photographs, ideally somewhere about the seven, eight, nine degrees would be better and the paper and parchment slightly higher. But if you can't, if you don't have two different storage areas, then putting everything together in that one space is fine. The main thing is that the temperature doesn't fluctuate significantly over time. And what we mean by that is there'll be some seasonal variations, but you don't want somewhere that's going to be west facing and in part of the day it's going to be very, very warm and in part of the day it's going to be very, very cold and that's going to fluctuate daily. You're also looking for a dry environment. So you're looking for something with a relative humidity of around 35% to 60%. Um, and gradual changes within these scales will cause minimal damage. You can, I mean, how do you actually check that in practice is a question that needs to be answered. Um, you can buy equipment to monitor temperature and humidity for less than £20 and a set of batteries. There are specialist suppliers who will provide them. Um, the only issues with those are that you need to check them physically to make sure your conditions are okay. So they're ones that sit on a shelf and you've got to go and check them. You can buy very, very sophisticated systems that run off computers that have electronic logging systems. But honestly, the bog standard less than £20 in a set of battery system for temperature and humidity will be fine. It will still do the job. It just means you've got to check the conditions and check the space on a much more regular basis. Another thing to think about is air quality. And that will obviously depend on where you live in the country as well as where your archives are, you know, positioned within a building or, you know, particular building or particular area. Airborne particles such as dead skin cells, sand, soot and textile fibres can all land as dust on objects which are uncovered. And what you don't see when you see a layer of dust is that it can be greasy, it can be grimy, it can be abrasive as well as chemically and biologically active. It could actually be acidic, which will then eat into the documents and cause kind of burning on the documents. There's, there's a huge amount of issues in there. 
So ideally what you need to do is appropriately package your material in boxes to prevent them coming into contact with the dust in the first place. And that way you can clean shelves, you can clean the tops of boxes, you can clean floors round about the collections without having to disturb them all the time. Use sturdy cardboard boxes rather than plastic ones with solid lids and which haven't previously contained food just to keep those pests away. Um, archive services tend to buy acid free boxes. If you can get them, that is brilliant. Um, and bear in mind as well that if you need to buy specific archives boxes, so kind of the ones that archive services are using, it's quite often very expensive to buy in small quantities. So it's worth asking your local archive service who buy in bulk, is that a service they can provide? Can they sell you two or three boxes out of the two or 300 that they've bought recently, for example? The other thing boxes do is they protect the contents from excess light, which can cause the fading too. So you're more likely to reduce that fading by having them in a dark environment, having them in a box. So where air quality is an issue, air circulation is an issue too. So if you keep the air circulated behind and around your shelving, it can help avoid mould growth. And it's as simple as leaving gaps between your boxes and exterior walls and gaps between your shelf with your materials on them and the shelf above and gap between the floor and the first shelf. So that just allows the air to circulate and it's less likely, although not going to completely mitigate mould, it'll stop stagnant air and it might stop some of those problems as well and kind of hot spots and cold spots building up. So between your collections and the building fabric, so the exterior wall, there needs to be a gap of at least 15 centimetres, 150 millimetres. Between your collections and the shelf above, there should be an air gap of around 5 centimetres, 50 millimetres. Um, and leave small gaps between the boxes to allow further air circulation between them as well. So essentially, the long and short of this is don't overfill your storage space. So if that's your storage space, what packaging should we be using? So we've had a chat already about boxes and using acid-free cardboard boxes. Effectively, what you want is inert packaging. You want something that's pH neutral, which is free from sulfur, peroxides, metal particles, and sizing agents. We have cardboard folders, boxes, paper envelopes for photographs, and inert cotton tape for tying folders closed. It doesn't have to cost the earth though. As long as it's pH neutral, that's what you're looking for. Archive services can also help as we do, as I say, buy in bulk. It's worth talking to your local archive service. The case study that's on the screen, I won't go into in any detail, but it is available on our website. Um, it's a case study of a community group in York who actually transformed their entire archive space um, and outbuilding into a specialist archive storage area, but they did it for around the £700 mark. So it doesn't have to cost the earth for storage and packaging and fitting out spaces. Um, so it can be done. It's a good case study to have a look at and see what you think. If you find it impossible to store your archive yourself, with all these conditions or it's in the wrong place or it's in the loft and there's nowhere to actually store it appropriately, you also have the option of depositing it with an archive service. Um, you would have to have a collection that fits within the collecting policy of that archive service, but archive services can advise on that. Um, so as a last resort, I mean, obviously we want to be collecting new archives and we want to be documenting more accurately the areas that we serve and the people that are in those areas and what they're doing. But if there's a more appropriate option for you to keep it yourself, even in the short term, as we'll see in the third of these presentations, that's the best course of action. But do talk to your archive services if you think there's going to be a threat to your collections. So storage and packaging are two of the main issues that we find. But the third major issue to cover in this is archives handling because actually the best thing you can do is handle documents as little as possible. As I present this, the reason that we're doing this online rather than a face-to-face -face session is partly because of the coronavirus pandemic. So I've tried to fit the terms and conditions and the, the, the handling key points of this 
into that framework as well to give you more of an idea because there's some good conservation guidance coming out with those things in mind. So wash your hands thoroughly before working with documents or books and don't wear lotions or creams. You do not have to wear cotton gloves for paper documents. Some archive services say yes, some archive services say no, but it does inhibit your manual dexterity if you do wear cotton gloves. So things like turning pages can become more complicated. I would recommend though, nitrile or latex gloves for photographs as a, as a must. The reason that a lot of services wear gloves or don't wear lotions or creams, this is all about the oils on your hands and them transferring to the documents that you're handling. And you might not notice it, but it can be sweat, it can be creams, it can be lotions, um, it can be hand sanitizer at the moment as well. And all of those will have an impact, a small impact, but which builds up over a long period of time. So that's why the nitrile or, late, nitrile or latex gloves are advisable for photographs. Those chemical layers on a photograph are much more unstable than a paper or a parchment document too. So you need to take particular care with them. We have worked out that hand sanitizer has been shown to damage paper in test settings. So kind of conservation test settings. So if you need to use hand sanitizer for any reason, I would say use nitrile or latex gloves. They fit tighter on your fingers. Your manual dexterity is likely to be slightly better. Um, and do not place archives directly onto a recently sanitized surface. So use uh, an inert sheet of paper or a sheet of cardboard that you can pop the documents on. As a general rule, do not touch the text on the pages, regardless of what you're looking at. The inks can react differently to the paper as you handle them. There can be problems there. And if you've got a folded document that just won't open, don't force it open. Because as we've already seen, those edges, those creases are more vulnerable and they're more likely to split as you try and pull the document open. So in those cases, consult a conservator. Quite often you'll find that pages um, have a tendency to curl up or documents won't sit flat on a table. And in those scenarios, you should use weights rather than holding them down with your hands or with your arms as you're leaning over them. So use clean weights where you can, even if it's using um, kind of tins of beans wrapped in a pillowcase or padded out. Um, if it's books, you can even use rolled up um, towels on either side of the spine, which will help support books and support those book pages. Hold documents by the edges and keep them flat using two hands. And if that's difficult, you can use a piece of card underneath as you're moving them around. And as I say, the manual dexterity is a problem with gloves sometimes. So you can use a bone folder, which you can buy online or a piece of card even just to help turn the pages. Please do not, under any circumstances, lick your fingers or fold over page corners. It's not great for archives at all. As I say, use book support. So you can use rolled towels on the spine. You can also buy, if you really, really want to, you can buy specialist book supports from suppliers, um, which will act as kind of a a pillow that will move and protect the spine and as the spine moves the the contents a bit like a bean bag the contents will move to kind of protect the volume as you work your way through it and if you've got flat uh, rolled or curled documents particularly some older panoramic photographs were then rolled up um, don't attempt to flatten them yourself because they may well crack and tear in the middle so in those circumstances contact a conservator and see what they can do if anything because it's it's a case of changing the humidity to see if you can actually get it flattened out and you would get it back flat right all the other bits and pieces of general general guidance so Please, 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 please do not use adhesive tapes, staples, pins, metal paper clips or rubber bands. Um, staples, pins and metal paper clips, um, aside from brass paper clips we've already talked about, they have a tendency to rust if they're kept in the wrong conditions. Same for treasury tags where you've got the metal ends on treasury tags. Um, adhesive tapes like sellotape, over time, they will go really hard, they will go really crusty, and they will leave a residue across the documents that you've been sellotaping. And rubber bands are the bane of my life. Rubber bands will go very, very hard around the documents and just solid. And they kind of need chipping, specialist chipping off to kind of remove them. It's very difficult to do. So brass paper clips, if anything, brass, um, the 
split pins and things like that if you need to that's the best thing to do go for brass do not eat drink or smoke around the documents part of this is pests part of this is damage so if you knock over your mug of tea um, part of this is the kind of residue in the dirt and the the odors and things will get picked up around the documents and also smoking around documents is just a fire risk so part of its security and part of its pest management and issues with the documents if you've seen the first of these presentations where we were talking about box listing and talking about archival catalogues, you might want to reference the items in your collection um, as part of an archives catalogue. If you're going to do that, please don't use ink for labelling your documents or books. Uh, use an HB pencil and don't press too hard. The alternative to that is you can buy fairly cheaply archival bookmarks, which are pH neutral sections of card, and you can record the information on there and then slot that inside the book. So that's the alternative to, to that. So up until this point, we've been looking mainly at physical records, so paper and photographs, but you also need to think about your digital records and storing them appropriately. It's just as important, but they have different risks. So obviously they don't have the same sort of environmental risks. Um, so whilst a mouse might eat through your computer cable, it's not going to damage the contents of your hard drive. Um, but what I thought I'd do is show you a bit of one of the films that we made previously in 2014 um, to talk about storing your digital records and the options for that. The issue we've got with digital, it's not as scary as my headline makes it sound. Um, it's just that many methods are not yet tried and tested. So we don't have all the data we need to give you one secure option for how to store your digital records, which is why you'll see in the presentation there are a number of different options. So if I Welcome to Explore York Libraries and Archives. This film has been created by community groups in York to help you identify, manage and use your community archive. In this video, we're going to look at what digital records are, the format you can store your records in, how you name those files, and look at the basics of social media. So first of all, what are digital records? The most important thing to remember about digital records is it's anything that is born digital. It's anything that was originally created in a digital format and stays that way. Digital records include your text files and any audio and visual material that you may create. There are various different places you can store your digital records, so it's really important to know the pros and cons of each of these. There are three main places you can store your digital records. The first is your hard drive on your home PC. The second is thinking about external storage, such as external hard drives and USB sticks. Uh, I've heard that external storage doesn't last very long. That's a really good point. External storage is a short term solution. So it's really important to bear in mind that it does have a shelf life. So for example, USB sticks last between one to 10 years, hard drives two to eight years, and CDs, DVDs, or Blu-rays roughly two to 10 years. Your third option is cloud storage. So that's storing material online. And this acts as a great backup to your hard drive on your computer. What about cost? There are a lot of free cloud storage options, but if you do have a lot of records, you may need to think about purchasing additional storage space because you'll only get a limited amount of storage free. Remember to keep all your versions of digital records updated across at least two different mediums and make sure that more than one person has access to your digital records because you really don't want to be relying on just one person to manage everything. What format should I store my records in? We recommend that you store your records as a PDF. These are a more static version of the original record and the metadata behind it will store exactly what program it was originally created in. If you have access to the more advanced version of Adobe, which is Adobe Acrobat, then you can store things as a PDF A. So the A means archive. So it basically means that it cannot be altered at all as a version, just making it a safer option for long-term storage. With photographs, we recommend you keep two versions, 
keep the larger TIFF file, which is the high quality version, which is perfect for your archives. However, because it is a large file, it can be difficult for providing access. So what we would say is also keep a JPEG version as well. They are a smaller version and great if you need to share documents. In terms of naming your files, keep your file titles short and easy to understand. Also, make sure that your digital files match the structure of your wider archive collection to keep everything consistent right the way across. Right, as I plug my speakers back in. So hopefully that gives a bit of an overview of digital, but to summarise what has come out in that film. Try to store your records in more than one format. So in two places, so effectively on your PC and backed up in cloud storage. Um, try to avoid removable media such as CD-ROM and USB sticks. Try to transfer your content to a PC or cloud storage or both. We do recommend PDF or PDFA as a more stable format, but you will lose some functionality. There are programs out there now which will help you take the metadata out of your records and store all the information you need with the records in its original format, in their original format. Um, the issue with that is, is that particularly with proprietary software, so things like Microsoft Office products, for example, you have to keep migrating your files between the different versions and if you don't do that they can become corrupted so the most straightforward way is keeping everything as a pdf or a, an archival pdf um, but alternatively you can keep them in their original format and just keep making sure that you resave them as the latest um, release of the software that you're using or a compatible version in terms of photographs, if you're digitizing them or if they're born digital, they're digital photographs, TIFF is the best form to keep them in. Um, but the files can be enormous. Um, our image database has about seven and a half thousand images on it. And some of those files, individual files on there are about 100 megabytes each. So they can be really huge. They're very detailed. They're great for doing high quality research. But if you're needing access copies, things that you can open quickly, that you can send for other purposes for the web, it's worth keeping the same set of photographs as JPEG files too, just because they're smaller, they're much easier to, to use and to attach to websites and things. I don't really mind, and we don't really mind what naming conventions you use for your digital files, as long as you know exactly what's what. So you have a system that works for your organisation. And please do remember, if you update one copy of a file on one storage medium, make sure you update them all or replace them all so that every system that you're saving them onto has the same version. The worst thing in the world would be losing your version on your PC and then realising that what you have in cloud storage is the version three before the one that you've just lost. So make sure that you're constantly updating and replacing them. So the number of places to look for um, further information on this. So we have web pages on our website, um, exploreyork.org.uk, which cover archival guidance for community groups. In particular on there, you'll find the case study that I used previous in this, previously in this presentation about the converting a, an outbuilding as a, to an archives storage space. And um, you'll find the detailed information there. I'd also want to draw your attention to the guidance booklet for community groups, which is available as a PDF, which gives lots of detailed information, more than I can cover in this presentation, about exactly what storage conditions and exactly what security conditions and things you need to be looking for. So that is the end of this second presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, obviously, in the live version, we had a question and answer. If you're listening to this and watching this on YouTube, then that won't be possible. But please do contact us if you have any questions. You can get us at archives at exploreyork.org.uk. Thanks for listening. <laughs>